Deltarune, Undertale, Undertale, Deltarune. Boy, I've made a hell of a niche for myself, huh? I started my first proper video as if I was ever going to talk about something else. Well, may as well start somewhere, right? Welcome viewers, I'm Vivat Veritas, and before I'm working 24-7 making Deltarune content when Chapter 3 drops, I thought I would spend some time talking about other media that I like. In case it wasn't obvious from the videos I make, I am very much a quality over quantity person. That is to say that I like a few things very passionately. One of those things, unsurprisingly, based on my music choice, is Pokemon Mystery Dungeon, specifically Explorers of Sky. It helps that the Venn diagram between Explorers of Sky fans and Deltarune fans is a circle. I do particularly like the whole franchise of Rescue Team, Explorers, and Super, and insert Gates to Infinity joke here, but Explorers of Sky holds a very special place in my heart. It was actually my favourite game of all time until it was beaten up by, uh, look we'll get around to that later. The point is, Explorers of Sky has had a very large presence in my life, and I'd really like to talk about it on the channel. To get ahead of the situation, yes, this video will just be talking about the Explorers of series, and I'll mostly be using Sky as the poster child, since there isn't anything in that that isn't in Time and Darkness, aside from one of the best game opening songs ever made. The title just isn't as catchy with the full name as good as it is. So what have I decided to put my grubby analysis mitts on? What element of one of my favourite pieces of media of all time am I intent on ruining this time? Well, although a lot of people talk about how much of a banger Explorers of Sky is, I haven't really seen any thematic or narrative analysis, which is a crime considering how much people harp on about the story. To be clear, the story is very good, but it is also a Pokemon game. The text is actually pretty rich, with thematic texture and wields its visual and metaphorical shorthand just as expertly as its lead motifs. One that particularly stood out to me in my last playthrough was how much the concept of light has to play in the story and the thematics of the game, and how incredibly salient it is in many of the most emotional and important moments of the game. When I talk about light, there are a couple of things that I mean. Most notable is the literal physical light. Whether that is a rising sun, a ball of light, or the rainbow iridescence of a stone ship, these are all somewhat tangible, visible effects. The trick is then to figure out why this physical light was used, and how it's being used thematically. The other option, naturally, is the metaphorical light. This one is a bit harder to notice, so I'm going to make an effort to define it. Like how a metaphorical darkness in Deltarune was described as a corruption or an evil, the metaphorical lightness is a lightness of the soul, generally love and belief. Now that isn't to say that all good is light and all bad is darkness, but this is a Pokemon game for children, and as you'll definitely see, it leans on some of the traditional understandings of morality. To be clear, this is mostly seen through the inverse, that being that darkness in Explorers is very much a corrupting and evil force, and it's fair to consider light as its counterpart considering it's, you know, in the same piece of media. We'll get a bit more into how darkness and light interact in the rest of the video, but what's important to remember is the fact that light takes two forms, a literal light and a metaphorical light. Regardless of which type is used, sometimes it's both, it's used quite a lot by the game to talk about a wide range of themes that I'd love to spend some time talking with you all about. Of course, spoilers ahead for Explorers of Time, Darkness and Sky, and probably the other Mystery Dungeon games just to be safe. I intend on doing this game justice, and I hope you enjoy the ride. Join me, won't you? Before we talk about light though, we have to talk about the inverse as well. Of course, the opposite of light, as all of us Deltarune heads know, is darkness. No WD Gaster today, but in a game called Explorers of Darkness, you bet there are some hints. Ultimately, darkness is used as a pretty basic representation of the inverse of a lot of the themes of the game. Loss, corruption, and despair. Those located in the future of darkness have their hearts corrupted by it. Grovile calls out this much in Spiritomb, a normally timid Pokemon that has been twisted by the dark future. The fail states of the game, the planet's paralysis and the world being consumed in a nightmare, both have darkness at their core. It's a literal darkness, with the sun never shining or everyone being trapped in the nightmare, but it's also a metaphorical one with the death of hope and goodness. That's actually the in-universe intention as well. Darkrai, the overarching bad guy, gains his power from darkness, hence the darkness as a pairing with time rather than space. 
Fitting his name, Dark Ray sought to cause the planet's paralysis as it would inherently cause the world to be plunged into darkness, a world where the sun never rose, which would increase his power. When that failed, he went back to what he's most known for, nightmares! Even though this is claimed to be due to a distortion in space, that's just an excuse he uses to make Palkia fight you. Hell, the place where you fight him is called Dark Crater. I know that saying Dark Ray is related to darkness is the most basic take imaginable, but it's a fact that, like half of all spin-off games, making Dark Ray the final antagonist to beat inherently puts him in stark contrast with the themes of the game. One of the reasons that people love the story of the Explorers games is because it just works. One of the more subtle reasons for this is because Darkrai, with his obsession with darkness and despair, is such a good natural foil to the themes of light in both his nature and motivations. Well, that's enough about that. Time to get into the topic proper, hey? If you ask a fan of Explorers of Sky what scene stands out to them the most from the game, they're likely to mention a few, whether that's the beach at dusk, capturing Grovile, or fighting Dialga. One of the ones that would come up the most, I imagine, is when you and your partner lay eyes on the time gear of Fogbound Lake. The first time that you see a time gear in person, at least in the game itself, is a really captivating moment, and it's easy to believe that this is truly the treasure of Fogbound Lake. It's also objectively one of the hardest parts of the game up until this point, with a difficult gauntlet of dungeons culminating in facing Groudon in battle, which is by far the most difficult boss battle up to this point that can, of course, be cheesed with sleep and reviver seeds like any good Pokemon Mystery Dungeon boss. The fact that the developers specifically chose a Pokemon that summons harsh sunlight here is… probably a coincidence. You've overcome a lot and functionally proven yourself as an adventuring team with an unconditional victory, and your prize is watching the Volbeat and Illamese float around, lighting the guys that containing the time gear. That's right, this scene is so beautiful and memorable precisely because of the light that is incorporated within the scene. It's specifically basking in the light of the bug Pokemon and the time gear that causes this beautiful sight. It's inexorably tied to the concept of light. That's not saying too much though, technically light is everywhere because it's how we see. One important scene using light to signify success is not really enough evidence to claim it's a major theme. However, that's hardly the only evidence of this. In one of these stranger turns in Explorers of Sky, your graduation culminates against a battle in a pitch black hole fighting the master of all things bad and their deadly minions. It's a bit of a shock after the pretty chilled out mystifying forest even though you were warned about it by the guild, and it becomes an even more confusing situation where one of the minions who speaks suspiciously like Bidoof removes the whole cover. The master of all things bad seems to be Wigglytuff and the rest of the guild, and although he plays it off it's very obvious that not only were you not meant to know, but you also weren't meant to win. Indeed, the reason you did win was because light was shed on the situation, both literally and metaphorically. Thanks, Bidoof. The guide to the Hidden Land Lapras is summoned when the mysterious symbol on the wall deep in Brian Cave shoots a beam of light across the ocean in reaction to the partner's relic fragment. This is right after having to get through another boss battle, this time against Cabotops and the Omastar brothers, and being saved in a cutscene by Chatter. With a bittersweet victory still on your lips, this is at least proof that Chadot's sacrifice was not in vain, and that there's still time to save the world. This bittersweet victory is not limited to just the relic fragment though. Well, it kind of is, in a way. Of course, if we're talking about light in Explorers of Sky, we should really talk about the Rainbow Stone Ship. The Rainbow Stone Ship, as the name suggests, is a circular disc that emanates a long iridescent rainbow behind it as it flies and is what takes you to Temporal Tower. And it's also where you have your final confrontation with Dusknall. It's a bridge to your final destination and demonstrates to you that your effort is going to pay off, as long as you keep fighting. However, the fight doesn't end without sacrifice. Grovile stays behind to force Dusknall back to the future, and you depart with one less friend. Although the parting hurts, you have to stay strong. The next time we see the Rainbow Stone Ship, after defeating Dialga, you might be feeling deja vu. Yet again, your team has lost a member. This time though, it's you, and just like last time, your partner is trying to just keep going after their success tinged with loss. The Rainbow Stone Ship signifies this bittersweet victory best, a literal and metaphorical spark and vessel of light in the hardest parts of the game. 
You've fought so hard and succeeded up to this point. Just a little bit longer. You've just got to make it home. Something that's very interesting is that light also does kind of represent loss in the way that it represents the classic bittersweetness of the game. When you two end up in the dark future, the only real light comes from Dusknall Stockade where you're almost executed. The partner comments on it explicitly. Although it's hopeful in a way, it also represents what you've lost, both metaphorically your faith in Dusknall and literally your friends and home. And one of the most salient and consistent moments in Pokemon Mystery Dungeon, when you as the player character begin to disappear from the world, whether that's returning to your world or being erased from history, your body turns into light. Although you've beaten the game, it's never that easy in a Mystery Dungeon game, and light is the last thing you ever see. At least it's not the darkness of a paralyzed world, Grofar may say. However, of course, because it's still a Mystery Dungeon game, it's got a bunch of post-game, and you've got to be there for that. On the very same beach at dusk where you were found at the start of the game, Dialga brings you back to reunite with your partner, this time appearing in a ball of light. In all of these cases, light either indicates or is required for your success, both in a mechanical sense as well as a narrative sense. That's not exactly a surprise, as previously mentioned, but it's hard to ignore the way that a very large portion of the game's pivotal blockages are undone by the physical and metaphorical light of the world, especially having the big bittersweet victories that the Mystery Dungeon series is known for being deeply tied to light. Light is also very much used to represent renewal, whether this is a literal rebirth or a rejuvenation of sorts. A great example of light being directly tied to healing and renewal is the lighting of Luminous Spring, after you defeat Wiggly to I mean the Grand Master of all things bad. Funny how there's two examples in a row, it's almost like light is pretty important to the themes of this game. When time is restored, Luminous Spring is active again after spending quite a bit of time dormant, implied to be because of the collapse of Temporal Tower. Now that it's fixed, the light shines here again and you're able to evolve. Well, everyone apart from you for convoluted plot reasons. Still, the light returning to an otherwise dark place deliberately representing the healing that not only Luminous Spring, but the wider Pokemon world is undergoing is pretty easy to infer. On the point of the wider Pokemon world, there are a couple of times where light is representative of the renewal of the world itself. Most notably, this is seen once we have finally bested Dialga and we get to see the fruits of our labour, the restoration of time. Specifically, Tree Shroud Forest, formerly dark and frozen in time, is brought back to its normal state. It's full of life and colour and light, fully renewed now that time has been restored. Indeed, a metaphorical renewal takes place in the hearts of those in Treasure Town now that they don't have to worry about the collapse of Temporal Tower and time itself along with it, the metaphorical light of relief washing over them. It is not just this return to light to the scene that marks a renewal, though. The dark future we visit, thanks to the actions of Dusknall, faces this as well. If you've played Just Explorers of Time and Slash or Darkness, you're probably a bit confused, as the last we see of the Dark Future is when we leave it with Groval. However, when we get to see where Groval and Dusknall end up when they go through the Dimensional Hole, thanks to Special Episode 5 in Sky, we get to learn a lot about it. I'm going to be talking about it at more length later, but the most important thing to know is when Dialga is defeated in the future at the same time as in the past by us, the future is brought into brightness and light, renewing itself in a similar fashion to the present. These renewals happen in sync with each other, narratively and temporally, and this is especially highlighted by the two tracks that are associated with this event, For a New Life and Life Goes On. For a New Life plays at the beginning of the special episode, and is immediately striking as it uses the same melody as Planet's Paralysis, the threatening tune that plays when you and your partner enter the future for the first time. This is what I like to call the future leitmotif, and it appears in a couple of other songs such as Message on the Wind. However, in For a New Life, it's a bit different. Although the notes are the same, For a New Life is missing the beating drums that set up the tone of Planet's Paralysis, as well as having a calmer call and response compared to the intense thrumming of the response in Planet's Paralysis. This is just one of the reasons why I genuinely believe that this is one of the most beautiful tracks in the game. 
The use of the familiar motif along with the calming and beautiful plucking of strings and ringing of bells paints a picture of cautious serenity, with these slightly ominous strings that invoke Dark Hill and the previous future dungeons coming in in the later part of the track really adding to it. It's a song with a complex message, that you and Grovile have kind of one, but it's still dangerous and still tense. It's a warning and a promise, that things are awful now, but they will be okay by the end. Life Goes On, on the other hand, plays at the end of Special Episode 5, when we have seen the renewal of the future thanks to the actions of the heroes. It is a soaring, triumphant song that of course invokes the success established, but also has those incredibly strong feelings of hope and light. This song uses what 8-bit music theory has labelled the sky motif, emphasising the melodic finality of the piece in words that he can put a lot better than me. The point is that this song is meant to be satisfying, a true conclusion to the arduous and lofty quest of repairing this broken world. So what do they have to do with light? While their relationship obviously has a lot to do with renewal, in my opinion these are the themes of fixing the world, showing how wrong but inevitably fixable the world is, and the relief and joy of when it is fixed. However, as pieces of evidence towards light being linked to renewal, it's more in the musical composition and visual component that accompanies it. For a new life is inherently tied to the future of darkness, from the use of planet's paralysis to the placement in the return to the future, and life goes on is set to the scene of the sun finally rising on this barely surviving world. Light is incredibly salient in the scene, not only from the physical renewal of the world around Groval and the others, but also the light of relief in their hearts. That being said, a physical renewal isn't the only light that shines in the darkness of the future. In the future of darkness, the sun never shines and day never comes. It is a world of total darkness, and this blackens the heart of those Pokemon that exist in it. We see this time and time again when we are trapped in the future, whether it's Pokemon like Spiritomb that are made more aggressive than usual, or Dialga itself who has succumbed to darkness. So a question naturally arises, what would happen if these creatures played with darkness were given light? The clearest example is, of course, Primal Dialga, but their redemption doesn't really have anything to do with the light itself. It is a redemption, to be sure, but it's mostly based on our strength and determination, and light isn't really used as a motif outside of Primal Dialga having a darker colour scheme. We don't even really beat him with a metaphorical light of friendship. We just kind of get yelled at, and then spam reviver seeds until we win. It's something, I guess, but there's a much more interesting candidate for us to talk about. That's right, it's my favourite character from this game, the one with the absolutely hardest line of all, it's Dusknor, baby! Now, I know what you might be thinking. Dusknor is your favourite character? Not Groval or the hero or Wigglytuff, Dusknor? And the answer to that is yes. And the reason for that? Because he has an absolute banger of a character arc. Like life goes on, this is something we only see in Special Episode 5 of Explorers of Sky, so you'd be forgiven for missing it. After losing in the present day, he's forced by circumstance to stick around with Grovile, his homoerotic rival, as it seems that Primal Dialga has turned on him. It's a really interesting journey of denial that he goes through that brilliantly mirrors the one that the partner has in the main game. Although all evidence points towards Dialga discarding him due to his failure, just as Duskanel betrayed us in the main story, he still can't believe that all of his work, all of his trust, was for nothing. This really humanises him in a way, showing that his relationship with Primal Dialga isn't just one of blind loyalty or a tactical decision of survival, he seems to have genuinely been emotionally invested in it, regardless of his opinions on the nature of desire or affection. He continues to try to hold out hope, but he seems to slowly be convinced by Groval talking about making his life shine, doing something truly important that would carry on into the future. Unfortunately, it seems that a lot of this emotional change is for naught, as he plays yet another one of his classic pranks on Groval by luring him to a place to steal the soul from his body and possess him, returning to the future and foiling our plans. Pretty hardcore of course, but it doesn't end that well for him. As much as all of his reactions to Groval were apparently just a facade to get Groval to trust him, his words did have an undeniable effect, and Groval points out this much plainly. 
He specifically mentions Dusknall's shining spirit, and this tears Dusknall apart, having to actually grapple with a moral quandary for the first time. Against all of his better judgement, he listens to his own shining soul and rescues Grovile, his final ticket back into Dialga's good books from the trap he laid for him. Immediately after this scene, Dialga shows up to beat the shit out of Dusknor, it's a really good scene, I love this game, and suddenly an aurora appears in the sky above them. Obviously this is a weird thing to happen in the future of darkness, and although it's explained as the effects of our team succeeding in the past slash present, I don't think it's a coincidence that this miracle of light appears immediately after Dusknor has committed the greatest act towards his redemption he could have. The literal light represents the metaphorical light, better here than almost anywhere else in the game. Of course, the real doozy is just a bit later at the top of the vast ice mountain where the Polycule face off against Primal Dialga for the final time. We see the movements of the paralysed world hurting Dialga's darkened heart, and the light begins to fill the scene from the bodies of everyone, and they fight with all the power they have left to banish the world of darkness. Upon their bittersweet victory, the end comes. One by one, they begin to disappear with the song In the Morning Sun playing, the first morning sun that this world has ever seen, and Dusknor asks the question that seals his redemption, that solidifies his arc and how it relates to light. Raval, please tell me, my, my life, did it shine? When Groval responds with, yes, extraordinarily, Dusknor finishes with, I am glad, I, I am, I am up to the very end not wavering. Honestly, I lived because of you, Groval. Thanks to you, thanks to you, I, I have no regrets. And his body is consumed with light, disappearing. Up until his final moment, Dusknor wanted his life to shine like Groval's, and did not let his fear or his arrogance dissuade him. He truly lived. As he goes, we see the titular morning sun rise on this world, his final exit marked by the arrival of light. How poetic. All of this evidence is to say that Dusknor's redemption arc is imperative to understanding the themes of Explorers of Sky, that even though he failed, even though it seemed like his heart was corrupted and full of evil, the light of redemption was still able to pierce through, his shining spirit giving the right conditions and the right words and the right people was able to be helped and fixed, much like the broken and paralysed world of the future. This redemption, as you've seen, is inherently tied to both the literal and metaphorical light so strongly that it is impossible to deny. Although light is tied a bit to other character arcs, such as the partner with the beach at dusk scenes highlighting their character growth and Groval with his life shining, this example of Duskinol is just so potent that it exhibits my point perfectly. Let's have a look at everything we've seen so far. At the end of the day, the thing that all of these concepts represent is hope. The desire to succeed, the desire to be better, and the desire to start again is one of, if not the major themes of Explorers of Sky. The whole game is fighting against impossible odds and proving people wrong, proving that you truly can be great explorers and heroes. We've seen a lot of examples of this so far, the conflicted hope of the stockade, the hopeful renewal of time and the future, and the redemption of Dusknall. Nothing better encapsulates this feeling of hope though than the start of chapter 16, appropriately titled A New Dawn. You, your partner, and Groval have all returned safely from the future and converged in your partner's old hideout in Sharpedo Bluff. Although you remain sleeping after this strenuous time, both your partner and Groval can't sleep, and they end up watching the sunrise together. It's the first time you can really take a breather now that you're relatively safe back in the future, and the fact that it parallels the game's opening of the setting sun adds to the poetic imagery even more. The conversation that happens during this scene is inherently tied to this imagery as well. The partner specifically calls out the sunrise as a renewing, supporting our earlier point, but more importantly marks this sunrise, this thing we take for granted, as worth protecting. But why is that? Grovar mentions that seeing the sunrise strengthened his resolve, his hope to see his mission through. A beautiful light like the sunrise and sunset, two very salient aspects of this game, invoke hope in the people to keep fighting the darkness. But that's not all. 
Groval also mentions the point of despair he reached in the future when surrounded by Dusknor and Primal Dialga, and how he had given up. The partner though never gave up, never lost that hope, and it's explained that we, the hero, invoke that hope and determination in them. It's important to remember that this whole conversation is set up as the same time as the sun slowly rises on the world, bringing light into the world much as we did to the lives of our partner, Groval, and the whole Pokemon world. All of the game works towards this, really, with the relatively basic story of good versus evil accentuated and built to be more than it ordinarily would be thanks to the complexities of how light and darkness are used. Light is so good to use as a visual shorthand precisely because of how many meanings we can ascribe to it with our basic knowledge of thematic analysis. Even when I mentioned at the start of the video that light is a major theme of this game, you are probably already thinking of the examples and what they mean. After all, listing a bunch of examples is easy work. The actual hard work is taking a look at the discovered examples and seeing what themes they're making and why that's important. Success, renewal, redemption, and all culminating with a major theme of hope. That is what light represents. The reason that light was used to illuminate all of these themes is difficult to explain, of course. I'm not a mind reader, and I don't know what was going through the heads of the developers when they decided to use light like this. What I can say, though, is that light is particularly effective in this setting as a visual and metaphorical thematic tool because it is so interwoven in the traditional battle of light and dark without it being strictly moral. Although Darkrai is indeed the main antagonist, the game tells us that he too deserves to live in this world, much like Dusknor and Dialga before him. The hope of a better world, a world of redemption and love and kindness, is what is at the core of these games. And what better idea to use to illustrate that than the light in all of us, light itself. These things are worth fighting for, worth keeping a light in our hearts. And miss trial and tribulation and darkness bearing down on us. I think, at the end of the day, that's why a light is used in Explorers of Sky, and why that's so important to understanding the game's core message. Well, after saying light is here so it's important approximately a thousand times, we're finally at the end. Thanks so much for sticking with me through all of this. I know that the subject was a bit different than normal, but hopefully you enjoyed it all the same. I'm honestly really proud of it all, and I'm just glad I get to talk about Explorers of Sky. As for what's next, I'm planning on going back to Deltarune and Undertale-related stuff, but I've got a couple of ideas, so if you've got a topic you'd like for me to take a look at, I'd be happy to. A massive thank you to my patrons Meggie, Michael Bates, and Kayla Barker for their continued support, and a reminder that you can sign up whenever you'd like using the link in the description below. Feel free to leave a comment about your experiences with Mystery Dungeon, or just about anything, really. I love reading them. Until next time, I've been Viva Veritas, and I'll see you again soon.